Hey folks, Geek for Fun here. As you can probably tell from my channel, I'm a huge fan of Dragon Ball. But, something you might not know, is one of my other loves are myths. Tales of Gods from other cultures always captures my imagination, and given Dragon Ball takes inspiration from myths itself, it seemed like the perfect place to tell a story about my favourite myths of all, the Norse Gods. Before jumping into the video, I want to give some context. This story takes place in the Dragon Ball Super manga canon, so Goku knows the Hakai and used the Kaioken against Jiren, not here, so keep that in mind. This story starts soon after the events of the Broly movie, but before Morrow. Given the Morrow arc is currently taking place, I didn't want to include it as I can't predict where things might end up. The characters introduced will be my interpretation of what these characters would be like in Dragon Ball, with the primary source being the myths themselves. No Marvel comic stuff here, so Thor has red hair, not blonde, and Loki is Odin's blood brother, not his adopted son. Other things will be changed here or there, but hopefully you can take this story as a fun imagining of what could be if I wrote the next super arc. With all that said, let's begin. Deep in the oldest part of space, shockwaves that had once threatened to destroy the universe itself were now being focused only on the two fighters battling on Beerus's planet. The Super Saiyan God and the God of Destruction were having their long-awaited rematch. Alder and Supreme Kai watched the battle through their crystal ball, dreading the thought of the pair going too far like last time. Shin having a look of melancholy on his face as he watched the two battle, feeling his lack of power weighing on his mind. Whis stood on the sidelines, carefully watching every movement his two students made, but he knew that this fight was soon about to reach its end. Goku was pushing his mastered blue form even further than he had against Jiren, attacking Beerus with every bit of speed he could muster, every bit of power in his body. The Divine Kaioken allowed him to catch Beerus off guard a few times, but the wall between them was still too high, and once Beerus stopped playing with the Saiyan, it was all over. The Saiyan desperately pulled all his power into one gigantic Kamehameha, but Beerus simply sighed in disappointment before sliding across the beam with a faultless grace, launching a devastating kick to the Saiyan's temple. Goku was sent hurtling to the ground, the mighty aura of his blue form fading as Beerus approached the Saiyan in his crater, placing his foot on the Saiyan's head. He was disappointed that even after Goku showing him the tournament of power, he could still not call upon Ultra Instinct at will and without it, he was no match for Beerus. Despite this, Goku laughed, amazed at how strong Beerus was, and he was still trying to get up, commentating that after Jiren and Broly, Beerus didn't seem as unreachable as he once did. This comment angered the god, and he began to press his foot down harder on Goku's head. He was already cranky at being awake, but Goku's words had struck a nerve. Beerus liked his position at the top, and seeing mortals getting close, to even surpassing his level was troubling. He still wanted a rival, he wanted a good fight, but the thought of him eventually being left behind in power and his authority having no weight frightened him. Still, at least when it came to Goku, it seemed that he still had a long way to go. Whis broke the pair up, deciding that this display was enough for today and that asking Goku to perform Ultra Instinct would never lead to him using it. Thinking about how to turn it on meant his thoughts were too preoccupied to use it. Beerus thought about making a snide remark at Goku, but Whis was quick to point out that although Beerus was able to use it in combat more consistently, it was not close to the level of instinct that Goku had reached, and so they were both far from perfect. After some grumbling from Beerus and some laughter from Goku, the three finally dug into their cup ramen. On Earth, however, similar shockwaves to Goku and Beerus' fight echoed across the planet, but with a different more menacing sound, the sound of thunder. The shockwaves reached a fever pitch as a gigantic man arrived in the outskirts of Satan City in a rainbow-colored beam of light. The stranger's wild red hair blew in the wind as he began to move towards the city, his every step causing a strike of lightning in the sky. Inside the city, another kind of chaos was raining down. An in-progress heist was being thwarted by not one, but two of the greatest heroes ever known to mankind. The Great Saiyan Man and the Great Saiyan Woman. Thanks to Piccolo taking care of Pan, Gohan and Vidal were able to have a date in the first time in what felt like forever. 
spending the day going to a movie, shopping, and now even managing to stop some crimes in their costume. The day had been something Vidal needed, and with Pan getting older, she felt it was a good time to slowly begin her training once again. Especially now that Gohan was taking that side of things more seriously too. Gohan even joked that the sudden thunderstorm was a great way to time their poses. Vidal asked if Gohan was really alright taking the time to do this, as with his training, work, patrolling, on top of being a father, he seemed to be burning the candles at both ends. Gohan, however, responded with a smile, as although managing everything was tough, it let him finally do everything he wanted to do. Learning a bit of time management was an easy price to pay for that. The couple's conversation was interrupted, as the seemingly harmless thunderstorm erupted into a burst of lightning that shot down near Vidal's father's house. Inside, Mr. Satan was cowering behind a sleeping Margin Boo, while the red-haired stranger from before stared intensely at the champ. In a voice as deep as the thunder outside, the stranger explained that his name was Thor, God of Thunder, and the mightiest in all the Nine Worlds. He had been to Earth centuries ago, and had enjoyed his time there, given mead and women as he slew dinosaurs and monsters for the people. They had declared him their hero, but in his absence, he had been informed that the planet no longer remembered him, that the mighty Thor had been replaced by Mr. Satan. Thor declared an open challenge to the champ, wanting a gigantic battle to prove who truly was the strongest. Mr. Satan, however, was terrified, coming up with the excuse that since Thor didn't have a manager, he wouldn't sign up for a fight against a no-name amateur. Thor paused for a moment. Supposing that this made some sense. Thor was powerful, but not very bright. Mr. Satan was shocked at having managed to talk his way out of the situation, with Thor asking how to acquire this manager. Unfortunately for Mr. Satan, a sharply dressed man, followed by Mr. Satan's own manager, entered the room almost on cue. The man explained his name was Mr. Man A. Gurr and that he had already set up the battle in advance, with Satan's own manager holding up the documents, a hypnotised look on his face. While Thor was confused, he was excited that it seemed things had worked themselves out, deciding to fight immediately. Throwing a punch towards Mr. Satan that would have killed him instantly, had Gohan not intercepted the blow in the nick of time. Thor was angered at his battle once again being interrupted, while Gohan, followed by Vidal, performed their entrances. After the poses were done, the God of Thunder clapped in excitement, as it seemed to him that these must be strong warriors who understood a good introduction. Quietly thanking Gohan and Vidal for saving him, Mr. Satan declared that Thor must have to battle his number one pupil to prove that he would be worth fighting. Gohan agreed, and instructed Vidal to take Mr. Satan to safety, as just that one block punch was sending shivers down the young Saiyan's spine. While the mysterious man A. Gurr tried to interject, Thor quickly brushed him aside, eager to battle this new foe who had managed to block one of his punches. Gohan tried to fly to the outskirts of the city, but Thor overtook his speed and backhanded him back into the street. He declared that this battle must have an audience, and any further attempts at flame would result in more than a love tap. Gohan decided he'd just have to try and end this as fast as he could, powering up to his ultimate form and attempting to knock Thor into the air with a sudden uppercut. Thor's chin was knocked upwards, but he did not move. Instead, letting out a hearty laugh that this boy could strike with such force. Thor then returned the favour, launching an uppercut of his own that sent Gohan flying into the sky. The scholar's helmet had been destroyed by the blow, and he was still trying to snap out of a daze as the Thunder God came charging towards him. Thor's right arm smashed into Gohan's gut, causing his eyes to go white. Just two hits! and he was already losing so badly. Gohan had no idea where this guy had even come from, but he wasn't about to let him go back down there and kill his father-in-law. Gohan roared in fury and fought through the pain, launching a sudden flurry of punches that surprised Thor, smashing against the deity one after the other. Thor began to respond with his own punches, but Gohan gritted his teeth and took the ones he couldn't dodge, so that he could use the chance to respond with another of his own. This risky strategy was leading Gohan to take far more damage than the still relatively unharmed Thor, but it was all he had to fight against this unstoppable 
unstoppable force, and he refused to give up. With a last ditch effort, Gohan summoned all his remaining reserves to launch a spinning kick that Thor blocked with his left arm. Gohan quickly responded by using his momentum to send a punch towards Thor's face, which the god blocked with his right arm. Although those two hits had been blocked, the Saiyan hybrid saw his opening now, and used his free hand to fire a one-handed Kamehameha at point-blank range, engulfing Thor in a gigantic explosion. But Thor emerged from the smoke slightly tinged by the blast, but smiling at Gohan with an earnest glee. He was amazed that Earthlings had gotten so strong in the time he'd been gone, and asked the boy for his real name. The exhausted Saiyan was too shocked at his attack seemingly having no effect to respond at first, but explained that his name was Son Gohan. Thor declared that Son Gohan the Great shall have songs sung of his warrior spirit for eons to come, as he began to reach for the hammer that was hanging from his belt. Sparks were crackling in the air, the weight of the power being emitted from Thor just from the act of reaching for his hammer was causing lightning to blanket the sky in even greater intensity. Thor's eyes began to be engulfed with crackling power as his true might began to rise, with Gohan preparing himself to still stand and fight, despite knowing he had no chance. Until Vidal shot up from the ground floating between the two, surprising Thor and Gohan as she approached the god. She declared that this had gone on long enough. There had been no casualties, but the city was starting to take serious damage from that battle, and she would not let Thor kill her husband or her father just because of this god's ego. The invincible Thor now looked quite meek, as Vidal's shouting was causing him to reconsider his motives in all this. Like a child being scolded by a mother, Thor did try to respond that a warrior's death was nothing to be ashamed of, and that he needed to once again show the world who he was, while Vidal simply opened up one of her childhood books she had picked up after taking her dad to safety, showing the tales of Thor were still being told to people. Thor took the book in his hand, not grasping the words, but the pictures told the story well enough of a mighty being with a hammer that slew giants. This made the Thunder God feel relieved that he had not been forgotten. Gohan and Videl overheard the God mumbling that Loki had tricked him once again, but before they could comment, Thor thanked them for clearing up the confusion. He waved goodbye to them with a smile, deciding that his need for battle had been met for the time being, and he would need to confront Loki about the situation. The couple watched in confusion as the Thunder God vanished in the same beam of rainbow light he had arrived in, deciding that they needed to get Gohan healed and inform the others. Hidden on the nearby rooftop, Mr. Man A. Gur dropped his disguise, returning to his original form as Loki. Sad that his game had been cut short, but now intrigued about the mortals who could stand up to fall. After being summoned by Bulma, Goku, Beerus and Whis arrived at Capsule Corp, where Gohan and Videl explained everything that had happened to them. Goku was thrilled at the thought of meeting someone so strong, and let Gohan know he was proud of him for doing so well against him. Beerus, however, was uneasy as if he'd been reminded of a nightmare he had long since tried to forget. Vegeta, who too was interested by this Thor, wanted to know why Beerus seemed so terrified. The God of Destruction remained silent, while Whis explained that it wasn't Thor that Beerus knew, but his father, Odin. Whis explained that in the infancy of the universe, there was the world of Yggdra, a lush, vibrant world the people of Yggdra were a fierce lot, but also a cultured one. One such Yggdra was Odin, a strong, strapping lad, and admittedly, a bit of a dork. He loved knowledge, he thirsted for it, and through the technological magic of Yggdra, Odin traversed the young universe, absorbing knowledge everywhere he went. Over the course of his journey, Odin learned of the existence of the gods. Through cunning and trickery, Odin worked his way up from the Kaio to the Kaioshin, all the way to planet Kaishin, the homeworld of all gods. On planet Kaishin, Odin was able to gaze down upon all the other universes and realised his quest for knowledge is one that will take considerable time, more time than he in his short, mortal life would be able to accomplish. He stayed on planet Kaishin for many days, and as a result, 
Odin became incredibly hungry. He noticed an enormous fruit hanging from the kaiju tree. Though he attempted to climb the enormous tree, one of the fruit fell from it, but this was no ordinary fruit. It was a golden fruit. The fruit of a Kaioshin. Odin watched as a Kaioshin emerged from the fruit, Odin scribbling the details in his notebook, as he always did. But soon, hunger would overtake his judgement, and he devoured the meat of the golden fruit. It sated his hunger, but an unexpected side effect had occurred. He had been given the power of a god by eating the godly fruit. After becoming a god, Odin took the seeds of the kaiju fruit to his universe, planting it in the soil of Yggdra and creating an incomprehensibly large tree that's roots expanded throughout space, wrapping and connecting the nine worlds of his solar system. The tree's divine nature sealed it off from the rest of the twelve universes in its own small pocket universe, a tiny blip the size of a solar system that would go unnoticed by all. However, all the worlds being connected by a godly tree caused unforeseen side effects, causing the inhabitants of those worlds to become grotesquely strong. Odin even managed to reach the Omni King and earn his favour by telling him the funniest jokes, the scariest stories, and the cleverest puns. And as such, Lord Zeno paid no attention to the goings on in Odin's domain, allowing it to be sealed off from the rest of what was happening with only the people of Yggdra itself able to enter other universes through the Bifrost, a magic similar to Whis's staff. Everyone was amazed by Whis's tale, with Goku practically about to explode with excitement at the idea of meeting nine entire worlds of strong people. Vegeta responded that this still didn't explain Beerus's reaction, but before Whis or Beerus could respond, they were interrupted by the rainbow light of the Bifrost, with the god Boulder standing before them, holding out a scroll in his hand. In order to apologise for the acts of Odin's son Thor, the Old Father had invited the gods of Universe 7 for a feast in Yggdra's golden city, Asgard. I hoped you enjoyed the action-packed opening of this what if. It's something I'm very proud of and I can't wait to tell the rest of this story. Be sure to like this video, subscribe and comment to let me know if you want to see more. The amazing designs of Thor and Loki in this video were done by the incredibly talented Malik, author of Dragon Ball New Age. He even helped me refine a lot of the lore in this video, so be sure to check out his own series and all his social media links, which will be in the description. If you like the mythical stuff, but are left wanting more Marvel meets Dragon Ball, then not to worry, as Smugstick has you covered in his latest what if. Hey guys, Smugstick here. I'm just dropping in to say that be sure to check out my new video, What If Goku Was in Marvel Comics. Think of it as the sister series to Geek for Fun's What If Goku Was in DC. It's a lot of fun, and I hope you guys will enjoy it. We'll be discussing many things, including the X-Men, Fantastic Four, and the Avengers. So be sure to come by and watch the misadventures of Goku as a Marvel hero. Be sure to check out those what ifs and all the other what ifs we have on this channel already, including Dragon Ball DC, the story of Goku in the DC universe. We hope you enjoy, take it easy folks.